All right. So, the way we're going, I'll probably post some announcements. All right. So, where we're going, I'll probably post some announcements with some of this information as well. But next week, both classes will be replaced with a video. So, it's going to be a class recording of basically what I would have covered in class, except for it's going to have everything I would have done on the dot cam recorded in the video as well. Okay. So not only will I kind of go through things as typically like a class period would, part of that includes the top hat questions. So I'm still gonna post two class questions next week that go with each one of those recordings. If you watch the recordings, once again, it should be very easy to get all those points because I go through the questions in the video, right? So Al, I'm expecting that you watch those just like you would be attending class. Expect you to come answer both. Now, I won't have them set day to day, so I'll probably have both those videos posted at the same time on Monday, early next week. I might even get them posted tomorrow. The class questions associated with them, I won't have set until we do until the end of the week, right? So you kind of trusting you, you kind of time manage your weeks, right? To get on, watch those videos, answer those class questions. However, I am going to then kind of treat this like I would kind of a typical class. So after today's lecture, You'll see I've got it set to be up here at 4.30. You'll see module 11's quiz. So I'm still expecting module 11's quiz to be turned in by Monday night. I'll also have the module 12 reading, which is what you should do before you sit down and watch those recordings, right? Because that will be over module 12 material. That will also be, that will also pop up after class and be set to do at the end of the day on Monday next week as well. So I'm still kind of structuring everything like we would be having class. It's just that you physically don't have to be in class next week. Okay. Now, I will also put up there the module 13 reading, right? And the module 12 quiz next week, right? So once you watch those recordings, typically those wouldn't be due since we don't have class Thanksgiving break. Those wouldn't be due until the Monday after we return from Thanksgiving break, right? So you'll have all of next week all of Thanksgiving break, if you really want to, to get on, watch those videos, and then kind of do that next module reading and that next quiz before the end of the day, Monday, when we return from Thanksgiving break. Okay? Is that any questions kind of on, on the, like I said, structuring just like I would if we were meeting in class next week with our module readings and our quizzes. Um, other than that, that pack back assignment is also due at the end of next week, right? So make sure you're getting on early, getting that done. And I want to get an email at you know next Friday at 11, 1150 that you know you still have, don't have that done or I, I need extra time. We've got plenty of time to get on and get that done before the end of next week on Friday. Okay. Any questions about anything related to kind of this how we're moving there? Is that clear? Any questions on that? And I'll put up an announcement that kind of outlines some of this. Um I also, just to kind of preview, once we get back, um, we'll have one more week of new material. So that will be module 13. We'll then have a week where we just are going through, well, I'll post a practice exam kind of after Thanksgiving break, where you can start reviewing. We'll be going through a lot of those questions that week before finals week. And then our final exam is that Monday of finals week. Okay. Um, other thing I wanted to mention, let's see, it'll come to me. Um, Maybe it won't. Uh, oh, uh, CL sessions are kind of as normally planned kind of this Thursday and this Sunday. I'll get an announcement up about next week. So some of the CL leaders won't be here on Sunday because they're leaving for Thanksgiving yeah. break. I'm trying to get a good, you know, I've reached out to all of them. I'm waiting to hear back from a couple to know which of those CL sessions will still be available that um, Thursday and Sunday of next week leading into Thanksgiving break. But this week, this Thursday, tonight, and this Sunday, everything kind of as planned, okay? All right, before we jump into material, any questions about any logistics of kind of class moving forward? We're getting towards the end, right? So I'll also reiterate this, two things, because I had one person ask me via email and I've had several about the other. So I've mentioned this hypothetical grade tool I will revisit this after Thanksgiving break when we meet as we, as we get closer to the final. This is where you can kind of plug in what your current grades are, play around with the final exam grade to see what your final grade would be in the class. You can't just click on this and then 
change things here. This is just giving you a preview. Anything in Canvas you click on is just giving you a preview. You have to actually download the file to open it up in Excel and actually change the values. Okay, so if you want to use that tool, you actually have to download the file and be able to open it up in Microsoft Excel. This web browser can't open up Microsoft Excel, right? It's just giving you a preview of what the file looks like. Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah. For final exams. So we'll kind of talk about that as we get closer to the final. Um, generally, yeah, they they would because you have that time slot available. It'll be kind of structured around whatever that time would be. <laughs> All right. The other thing I wanted to mention because I'm getting questions on it, and I know that I've said it, but that's okay. The final will be over what? Everything we've covered? No. Right? I said everything in this class is cumulative in the sense that it builds on itself. But just like the second exam, was I asking you module two questions? So the final, I'm just going to ask you the last four modules since the last exam, okay? So we really wanna make sure we have a good understanding of this. We'll kind of summarize a little bit of what we did last class, just kind of revisit single price monopolists and then kind of keep pushing forward. So we talked about last class, if we had a perfectly competitive market, our, if we have one supplier, their marginal cost would be all of market supply. So a perfectly competitive market, we said, what's the equilibrium price and quantity? That's simply where the supply, right? If we only have one firm, their marginal cost is market supply, is equal to demand. So here's my perfectly competitive quantity. This would be my perfectly competitive price. We said at the equilibrium point in that long run equilibrium, for a perfectly competitive monopolist, price was equal to marginal cost. In fact, price was equal to marginal cost equal to marginal revenue equal to the minimum point of our long range average total cost. Right? Now, excuse me, if we have, a, so this perfectly competitive environment was essentially like the ideal world. That is where total surplus is gonna be maximized. Anytime we have any type of other market, any deviation from perfect competition, we're gonna have a loss, right? If total surplus is maximized there, if we move away from that point, total surplus will be going down or we have dead weight law. So if we have a single price monopolist, I didn't use this term as much last class, but we'll talk about different types of monopolies today. So everything we did last class was for a single price monopoly. They were just setting one price for the good they were selling. So they're gonna make their decision, just like a perfectly competitive firm would, where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. But they don't face this horizontal marginal revenue curve, right? We said their marginal revenue would be based off demand, but it will be twice as steep. So they're gonna choose, a lower quantity to maximize profits, right? The price they set will not be equal to marginal costs down here. They're gonna go up to the demand curve and charge the last consumer whatever their willingness and ability to pay was. Demand represents the marginal benefit or your ability and willingness to pay. So the price that that monopolist set was gonna be higher than the perfectly competitive price. We said just kind of intuitively. If I'm the only seller of a good, I can get away with charging a higher price. Now. This price is above marginal cost. We didn't really reference this term, but especially in future modules, we will. That difference between price and marginal cost, we're going to end up calling our markup. So there was no markup with a perfectly competitive firm. Price was equal to marginal cost. With a monopolist, that price they set will be above the marginal cost of that last unit. We're going to call that their markup. Okay. And we won't really dive too deep into to kind of that term in terms of monopolies, but when we get to monopolistic competitive markets, we will. Okay. So, because the monopolist chooses a lower quantity, what is total surplus? Anytime we're talking about producer, consumer, total surplus, it's the difference between the marginal benefits and the marginal costs. So for total surplus, it's the difference between the marginal benefits in the market, which are represented by the demand curve and the marginal costs. So because the monopolist is no longer producing any of these units or selling any of these units, the difference between our marginal benefits and marginal cost for each one of those units, that represents surplus that's no longer realized, right? Or if it's total surplus that no longer exists, that would be our dead weight loss, okay? So I kind of mentioned this last class, but just kind of giving us a, a, a kind of revisiting this here a little bit. I'll also kind of draw this, oh, that's not the one I wanted. Hold on. <laughs> I didn't have the middle screen last class, so maybe I'm a little bit out of, out of practice here. All right, so let's say we've got our quantity, we've got our price, 
We've got our demand curve. We've got the monopolist marginal cost. Marginal revenue is twice as steep, right? We just said the monopolist sets this quantity where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue, then goes up to the demand curve, to figure out what price they can set. So if I'm thinking about, well, I'll put it in here. So let's say consumer producer surplus, that's just gonna be the difference between the marginal benefits and the marginal cost to producers and consumers. So for our consumers, the difference between the marginal benefit, what was the marginal benefit to them? What reflects marginal benefits? Demand. Right, so we've got our demand curve. What would be kind of the marginal cost to consumers? The price they're paying. What's the marginal benefit to producers? Well, for them, the benefit is the price they're charging. And here, their marginal costs, well, we kind of think about this represents all of market supply because we only have one curve. So what's gonna be happening to consumer surplus? So I'll kind of give you, try to put this all on one graph and then I'll put just a monopolist in the slides. So let's say we were at this perfectly competitive point. Where would consumer surplus be? What's well, the difference between the demand curve and the price they're paying? Where would producer surplus be? It's the difference between the marginal costs and the price they can charge. So this would represent total surplus if we are at that perfectly competitive quantity and price. We're not though, the monopolist charges a higher price. So just intuitively, if the price is higher, what should happen to consumer surplus? It should go down, right? Price is a bad thing for consumers. If price goes up from a monopolist, what should happen to producer surplus? Increase, price is a good thing. We can actually see that take place here because consumer surplus would be now the area above the price the monopolist sets, but above that, sorry, above, below that demand curve, right? So we kind of see here, here's my consumer surplus now with this monopolist. Before it was this entire triangle, so it went down or decreased. What about producer surplus? Well, it's gonna be the area below the price they charge, but above their supply curve, but remember, they stopped selling at this quantity. So there was a little bit of producer surplus lost here, but even more was gained right here. Right? So we're gonna see that with a monopolist, producer surplus is higher, and sorry, I should say a single price monopolist, consumer surplus is lower and producer surplus is higher. And then we also had this area here, which represented what? A loss of surplus. So someone was saying it, dead weight loss. So these are really the impacts that a single price monopolist would have on our welfare, right? On consumer, producer, and total surplus. Okay. Anybody with me on, on this? Any questions on this before we switch back over to the slides here? Okay. So I've got just the monopolists kind of surpluses on this slide. Right, consumer, producer, and then dead weight loss. Okay, this is so not kind of having in that perfectly competitive kind of comparison. Okay. So it's not a horizontal line. We're just identifying at, so marginal cost is not horizontal, right? It's this line right here. So we're just identifying what the marginal cost was of the last unit the monopolist provided. Yep. Is it always going to be greater than the dead weight loss? Yeah, in fact, you can. So if you think about it, what would this area be? You would have the height times the base here. So as long as that quantity, the monopolist charges, as long as that's greater than this difference here, I mean, you've got height times width here would be height times width times one half. So that dead weight loss should always be kind of us. Now, I'm not going to extend it. We could complicate this. In fact, if it lowered the quantity so much that, well, actually, it, it, it can't be the case for what we're going to do because we have linear demand and marginal revenue is twice as steep. So it'll always be the case in any model we look at 
that dead weight loss here is going to be less than that gain that producers have. Now, if we didn't have linear demand, we kind of complicate this. Short answer is no, that doesn't have to be the case. But for what we're going to do, that dead weight loss will always be kind of less than um, the producer has will always be less than what their gain is. So they're always going to be better off. Yep. Okay. Any other questions on this before we keep moving? Okay. <clears throat> We'll skip through this. I'll come back to this later. I've got some, uh, this is some top hat questions we'll look at later. So we talked about single price monopolists last week, kind of revisiting how they choose quantity price, thinking about surplus that would exist. We're now going to compare that to what we call a price discriminating monopolist. So don't think of price discrimination as I'm charging people of different genders or different, you know, uh, racial, I'm not, it's not based off of personal characteristics other than a single characteristic, which is what is their willingness and ability to pay, right? So a very kind of obvious you know, form of price discrimination, and we'll go through some more later just to kind of give you a way to think about this. But if you go to um, like a diner or, or any, you know, what do they usually have? What type of discount? If you go there with your grandparents, what might they be able to get? Senior citizen discount, right? They know that older individuals are on a fixed income, and so they have a lower willingness and ability to pay. So essentially, that discount is like charging them a different price. All we're doing is trying to charge different consumers different prices based off we know they have a lower or higher willingness or ability to pay. Okay. So uh, you know another example of this: I have the same good, right? Maybe I'm trying to sell uh, I don't know umbrellas, right? Well, I know that on a day when it's raining. What can I do? Increase the price because that day those people are going to have a higher willingness to pay, right? Now, we'll talk about other types of discrimination that are probably better examples, but that's just kind of setting us up thinking about it's not based off of characteristics other than characteristics that will be related to your ability or willingness to pay, okay? Excuse me. So just intuitively, who do I want to charge a higher price? People that I know are willing to pay a higher price. And then some people, if I would have just set a single price, well, they weren't willing to pay as much. So at this higher price, they just wouldn't have bought my good. Well, maybe I could lower the price a little bit for them. And I will still have a price that's above my marginal cost. I could still earn some profits from that. Maybe not as great as before, but I know that if I charge the higher price, they just wouldn't have bought the good. So this is kind of the idea of what we're doing. We'll kind of look through this model here and then we'll kind of revisit it in some other, other uh so this will be the extreme, and then we'll kind of say, well, what if it's not perfect price discrimination? So perfect price discrimination would be if I could identify, so if I have this demand curve, and I kept marginal cost here just to kind of make it easier to think about, um, back in the long run, if we had no fixed costs, our marginal cost, if they were constant, this would actually be the same as our average total cost curve. So be a way in which we can start to think about producer surplus is really representing the same thing as profit. They always don't go hand in hand when we have fixed costs or we have increasing marginal costs. But if I keep it constant, those two things will be synonymous. So if I'm a single price monopolist and I set the quantity where demand is, sorry, demand, where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue, well, this is the single price I'm setting for my product. So what's true, if I could identify if each one of these quantities just represents different people, what's true about everybody on this portion of the demand curve? Well, they had a higher marginal benefit, so they were willing to pay this price because their marginal benefit was above the price. But what could I have done? For this person here, instead of charging them this lower price, they would have been willing to pay a price right here or a price right here, or in fact, a price all the way up to as long as it was less than or equal to their marginal benefit. So if I'm charging a single price, all of these consumers on this portion of the demand curve, I'm kind of losing money on because I know they would have paid me more. But what about everybody down here? Their marginal benefit is below that price, so they didn't buy the good for me. But notice, if I were to set a price right here for these consumers, that price is still above marginal cost. That price would be my marginal revenue. I could still generate profit for them. Now, the problem is I have to identify what consumer is who, right? Who has that lower, who has that higher marginal benefit. But I know that, this will exist. There'll be some people who are willing to pay more for this good, some people who weren't willing to pay as much. If I could identify who they were, 
I could charge them different prices and generate even more profit. So a perfect price discriminating monopolist is like this thought experiment where if I could identify every single one of those individuals' marginal benefits, what price would I charge them? I'd charge them exactly their marginal benefit. I know that's the point they'd be indifferent about buying my good. So instead of this twice as steep marginal revenue curve, right? So before, with a single price, we had our consumer surplus, area below demand, but above price. Our producer surplus would be the area below price, but above our marginal costs. Or here I said, because I kept mar marginal cost constant, we can think about producer surplus is really the same as monopoly or as producer profits, which we have monopolists here. So I had some dead weight loss. Well, if I can identify who these consumers are, I don't charge a single price. I charge each one of them exactly what their marginal benefit is. What does my marginal revenue curve become? Someone said it, the demand curve, right? So if the demand curve, if I can perfectly price discriminate, I no longer face this twice as steep marginal revenue. That was just the rep marginal revenue when I was charging a single price. So if I can turn that demand curve into my marginal revenue curve, what quantity would I choose? All the way out here. What is that quantity also? What market would also choose the point where supply or marginal cost is equal to demand? Perfectly competitive markets. What should be true about total surplus at a perfectly competitive market? It's maximized or we have no deadweight loss. So I'll kind of go through, I'll draw this out for you because I think I can use some colors to make it a little bit easier to follow maybe. So if I think about what's gonna be happening with a perfectly price discriminating monopolist, and I can even keep, I don't have to have horizontal marginal costs. I can still have them increasing. I just used it there to kind of simplify. Well, the demand becomes my price or essentially my marginal revenue curve. So marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So my quantity that a price discriminating monopolist would choose is the same as the perfectly competitive market. So total surplus, the difference between my demand and my supply curve, remember one firm, marginal cost of that firm is all of supply. Well, total surplus is still the same. But what is consumer surplus now? So if consumer surplus is the difference between the price they're paying and their oops, marginal benefit. Well, the price they're paying is the exact same as demand. So it's the exact same as marginal benefit. Consumer surplus is just zero. It's right, the exact same values for price and marginal benefit. So consumer surplus in these models goes to zero when we can perfectly price discriminate. If I could charge everybody exactly how much they're willing to pay, I can take all of consumer surplus and eliminate it. Well, we didn't have any dead weight loss, so what happened to that consumer surplus? Well, what is producer surplus? The difference between the uh, sorry, I wrote this backwards and no one called them on it, right? We're looking at consumer surplus. It's the difference between marginal benefits and price. doesn't matter for us here because that difference was zero, right? For producer surplus, it's going to be the price we can pay minus of our marginal costs. So where is producer surplus when we can perfectly price discriminate? Well, the price we're charging for every unit is different to every single consumer. So the area below price but above our marginal cost, producer surplus would be the exact same thing as total surplus if we can perfectly price discriminate. So dead weight loss gets driven down to zero, consumer surplus gets driven down to zero, and all of what used to be consumer surplus is converted into producer surplus. So who likes this? Companies, right? right? They, they, they're increasing their profits essentially, okay? Any questions on this before we keep moving? And I'll give a little bit more insight as to how this can occur. So we still have a monopolist, but they're no longer setting a single price. We're allowing them to perfectly price discriminate. We'll talk about what happens if they can't perfectly price discriminate here in a little bit. Okay. Any other? Yeah. Let's go ahead and take the last. Kind of. 
Um, so here we're looking at the market as a whole. So you can think about there's different consumers on this demand curve. The ones at the top who are willing to pay a higher price are likely the consumers who are more analyzed. So we're thinking about if we could identify like each individual, then like these are the more inelastic people. So I can get away with charging them a higher price. The people who are a little bit more elastic, I, I can't get away. I have to charge them. Up. Yeah, but it, there is a connection between that concept and what's happening. Okay. All right. So. All right. We just talked about there's no dead weight loss. Right, and all of consumer surplus has now turned into producer surplus. So um, I kind of already compared these two um, between that single price and then the perfectly priced pyramid monopolist. You know, we said that deadweight loss we had some for a single price monopolist, no deadweight loss for a for a perfectly priced pyramid monopolist. Um, we had consumer surplus still existed with a single price monopolist. It was smaller than a perfectly competitive market. But it was still there. And then once they were price discriminating, we drove it down to zero. So to your question, you're kind of anticipating who's going to be those people who pay the higher price. Well, those people on the top part of the demand curve are going to be those who are more inelastic. Okay. Um, and then as we lower the price for the people kind of on the lower end, we're going to attract people who are more elastic that when we were setting a single price, they just weren't buying the goods. Now, if I can charge them different prices, I can now sell to them at a lower price, which was still above my marginal cost. I could still earn a profit. Um, and then we talked about dead weight loss is based on the decrease. But just because we, this is where it gets to be like a philosophical question. Okay, we've eliminated dead weight loss. That's good for society, right? Well, maybe, because even though total surplus is maximized, what did we say was zero? Consumer surplus? Do we really want our consumers to have zero surplus and the companies to have all of it? Eh, probably not, right? Maybe the utility coming from consumers, we value slightly differently than the utility of companies. Now, once again, you get real ethical, like philosophical. Well, people are running these firms, or we really should be treating those people's utility any differently than we are people that are buying the product. That's a whole different class, right? But here we can just identify what's happening in this market. Okay. So um I mentioned kind of this idea of perfect price discrimination. And I'll give you an example where this can happen because uh, it might seem like it used to really be like a pipe dream. Like if I was teaching this class 40 years ago and someone asked me what was perfect price discrimination, I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> There's not really a good example of it. But how many of you have heard or have gotten a million ads if you're on social media from team? I don't know if I'm saying that right. I've seen it quite a few games. So this is like a company that sells like all these like um, little knickknacks, cheap clothing, like it's all cheap products for the most part. What is always true? The price they show you, everything on Timu is always on sale. Like they always show you the price, slash through it, and then what the price is to you, right? Or if you uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe trying to buy some high U gear since the football team is good. If you go on like Fanatics, they always show you a price and then there's a slash through it, you see a red price, what the price is to you. Well, part of that is marketing, trying to convince you that you're getting a good deal, right? But I've watched, uh, and this, I'm a little bit hesitant to say this because I don't have perfect support, but I've read enough articles to where there's some pretty good evidence that this is happening, and it'd be crazy if they didn't do it. So maybe you can see this on TikTok or something like that, maybe not, maybe my TikTok feed is a lot different than yours, right? There'll be two people side by side looking at the same product on Tinu, and what do they see? <coughs> different prices. So why might they be able to know that someone based off of your phone is willing to pay more than the other person? Well, anytime you do something on your phone, what do you hear in the news a lot about? Data breaches, right? If I'm a company, if I can go out there and somehow access what you're looking at in your phone, even if it's not like actually get into your phone, but I can just look at your account and like, if you've looked at this item 10 times, I know you might be a little bit more elastic than the people who bought the good they looked at the first time they looked at the last 10 items they bought. I can start to identify who's more elastic, who's more inelastic. I can look at the previous goods that you've purchased. So if I want fanatics, my guess is uh, I'm probably going to be able to pay a lot lower of a price for ID here than you might. I'm probably going to pay a higher price for the Detroit Lions here. 
right? So I'm from this joint. Fortunately, now I'm a fan. It used to not be that way. But these prices can vary because they can get at all of your data and what you've looked at on their server. So they kind of have some idea about what your willingness or ability to pay. Now, it may not be perfect, but if I can gather all of the data on my consumers, I could really start to identify exactly what their willingness and ability to pay were. I can get really, really close to perfect price discrimination. So like I said, we didn't used to have as many examples of this. With all the data that exists now that these companies can have on your spending habits or what you're looking at online, you got to believe that they're coming up with these strategies to be able to price discriminate against you, right? And the whole reason why is because if I can identify who's willing to pay more, I can charge them a higher price. People who wouldn't have paid as much, who just wouldn't have bought the good before, I can charge them a slightly lower price. Maybe not generate as much profit as the other person, but still some cause amount of profit. Yeah. I could companies do this um, in person. Hmm? I could companies do this in person. In person? Um, well, you know, we do it. We don't probably do it perfectly, but you can still price, like I said, with the senior citizen discounts. If I know there's attributes about people that would make it more or less likely that they could pay a higher or lower price. So I've got, I'll jump the gun since you're asking. I can kind of give you some examples. We'll return to this here in a second. So what are some other examples here? Um, we'll talk about, uh, you know, I've kind of already mentioned like senior citizen discounts, discount coupons. So like anytime you see like coupons and they, like Kroger sends me these all the time. I end up using like hardly any of them because I don't have the time to sit down and figure out exactly what's on sale this week. And I don't like carrying around. Well, but people that have a lot of extra time and are really worried, like they're, they're on a kind of, you know, really tight budget. Well, they're going to be a lot more likely to look through those discount coupons. They were probably a lot more likely to not pay as high of a price. And they might only buy my good if they have a coupon, right? So I'm using some attribute about people to kind of cause some price discrimination. Yeah. Yeah, right. So when you go to the store, you see the price of the good, right? That's if you don't have a coupon, you pay that price. Anybody who has the time or the willingness to kind of go through these coupon books can pay a lower price. They've essentially taken someone who cares enough about the price that uses those coupons who might not have bought it before, they can now pay a lower price. So there's just the definition of price discrimination, not perfect, but is that we can charge different people different prices. That's really what's happening when you use coupons. Some people who aren't using the coupons, they're paying a higher price than the people who are. Give you some other examples here. Uh, quantity discounts we'll talk about in a second, this will make a little more sense. But I can guarantee you one that takes place right now. All of you are not paying the same price to be here, right? For, for sure, right? I can say that with absolute certainty. Not only based off of in versus out of state, right? Which maybe that in versus out of state, they know that if you're out of state and you apply to IU, I mean, you're going to be moving away from home. Probably means that you were a lot, you were willing to pay a lot more to go to IU. There was a reason that you didn't apply to some university in your state. Even if you knew the sticker price was going to be a little bit higher, you were still willing to pay that. So they're charging you a higher price. Right? If you're in state, right, they know that, well, you know, you've got a lot of different options, right? You, you didn't have to come to state. So maybe we'll offer you a slightly lower price because you, you know you're probably a lot more concerned about price. You didn't go to a comparable university in another state because it would have been more expensive. Or even if you don't want to do the university out of state, need by based financial aid. Why do you have certain grants that are attached to your parents or your income? Right? Because they know if you have lower income, what is true about your ability, right? It's not just willingness, it's ability to pay for tuition. It is lower, right? So they still want you to be enrolled. So they offer need-based financial aid so that groups that didn't have as high of an ability to pay are still able to be enrolled here at IU. That's an exact, I mean, this is a definitional form of price discrimination. We're charging different people different prices based off of their ability and willingness to pay. So that willingness to pay often attached to things like elasticities, um, but you know, that ability to pay is also part of it, right? Usually attached to things more like income. All right. Any questions before we think about quantity discounts? All right, so I'll set this up and kind of show you what non-perfect price discrimination would look like. And then we'll kind of think about this in terms of quantity discounts. Okay? So let's say 
Um, I'm a single price monopolist. I'm making a decision based off of this twice as steep marginal revenue curve. I set a single price that would maximize profits. That would be at marginal cost equals marginal revenue at 20 units. Go up to the demand curve, the price would be 300. Excuse me. So all of this would be consumer surplus. All of this would be what? See how someone mouth it? Deadweight loss, right? I'm no longer selling any units past 20. Now, what if I could somehow identify these consumers? Like maybe I can't identify every single individual, but even if I could identify the first 10 that value this a little bit higher, if I could figure out who had a slightly higher willingness to pay and charge them $400, right? Well, now those first 10 units or those first 10 people, if you want to think about it that way, I can charge this higher price. I've made some additional money off of those consumers. Now I can still charge this lower price of what, 300 to those people who value it the next, the next 10 people who value it the next high. Okay? So I'm still making the same amount of money off of those people in between 10 and 20. I could then identify these people who had a lower willingness and ability to pay. They weren't even buying the good before. So that was just dead weight loss. So from these first 10 people, I took what used to be consumer surplus and I've turned it into producer surplus. From these people from 10 to 20, I've charged them now this lower price of 200. They weren't buying the good before. That used to be dead weight loss. They now are buying it. I'm now adding that to producer surplus. Right? So by being able to charge consumers different prices, right? even if I'm not able to perfectly price discriminate, right? I'm still reducing consumer surplus. It isn't zero here. And I'm still reducing dead weight loss. It's not zero here, right? Um, but in this scenario, I'm definitely increasing my producer surplus, right? So they're all moving in the same direction. I didn't get consumer surplus and dead weight loss to zero, but I was still decreasing consumer surplus, decreasing that dead weight loss and increasing my producer surplus. Okay? So in the perfect extreme example, that directional change is still happening. It's just that consumer surplus decreased all the way to zero and dead weight loss decreased all the way to zero. Well, here they're not zero, but they are still decreasing. Right? And you kind of see that even if we only have here three different prices. Okay. Um, kind of make this point, you know, how can we leave these up here on the sides. What if I even wanted to think about this, not in terms of individuals, like I can identify the first 10 people who pay the highest amount. Let's say I had one person. And so I have my price here, got my demand curve. Let's say I've got my marginal cost curve here. Well, I'm gonna keep it constant to make this a little bit easier. Sorry, let's do a constant marginal cost. Just make sure we kind of get this, this down. So maybe if I'm kind of setting a single price here, maybe the price I set is like, um, let's say $2.50. And this is no longer the entire demand curve. This is just one individual consumer, right? So I have a, a terrible uh, addiction to uh, fountain drinks. So I, I go to the gas station and get Diet Mountain Dew quite often. So I see these, these things that they always have posted, which is something like you can buy M&Ms or a Twix or whatever the candy bar is. And maybe the original price is something like $2.50. Well, anybody who is willing to pay more than that is gonna buy that good, right? If as long as I value that very first candy bar more than $2.50, I'm gonna buy one, right? However, for the same individual, are they gonna buy that second unit? Well, that second unit, they don't value near as much. So no, they're gonna stop. If the price was 250, they're just gonna purchase one, right? Now, what could I do is I can say, okay, well, I know that they value that second one a little bit less. So what offers do you see? It's usually like buy two, get them for, I don't know, we could do here, it's an easy number, $4. Well, what does that essentially do to the price of the second one? 
Well, for the first, I would have paid 250. If I now buy two, the total price is four. So really what was the price of that second candy bar? I was paying 250 before to get one. And yeah, essentially, I was really only paying a dollar fifty more to get that second. Maybe my marginal benefit of the second is a dollar fifty. Now I'll decide to buy both of these. Now notice in both cases that price is still above my marginal cost. But when I was only charging a single price, they didn't buy that second candy bar. When I kind of offer this quantity discount, which essentially is really lowering the price of that second unit. So it doesn't have to be that I'm charging different consumers even different prices. I could be charging the same consumer different prices for the quantity that they buy. We see this all the time, right? That you know, at every grocery store, buy four, get them for you know however much money. Essentially, they know that the very first quantity, you're always willing to pay a higher amount because what's happening with the consumer's marginal benefit? Declining as we buy more and more. So quantity discounts are really just a micro form, like at an individual consumer level, of price discrimination, right? Now, it's not price discrimination based off of individuals, it's price discrimination based off of the quantity that you're buying. I mean, this is really the whole reason, basically, why, like, um, uh, in a way, this is like kind of like Costco exists, right? Like, now, they're not price discriminating, but they're selling a much larger quantity. Those same goods are sold in Kroger or sold in all these other grocery stores. They're just offering kind of a lower price because they know you wouldn't buy 20 of these otherwise, right? Um, so quantity discounting would look very similar to like non-perfect price discrimination. Mm -hmm. Is this making sense what I'm kind of getting at here? Yeah. I'm just coming up with some hypothetical values here. Like we'll just assume that this is what their marginal benefit was. Then by offering that lower price, I could convince them to buy two. And you can kind of think about... Um, excuse me, here, was I really gaining any profit? Well, before my producer surplus, if I have a marker that looks better, would be here. If I kind of charge this additional one, what did I gain? I gained some additional producer surplus. So by offering these quantity discount, instead of just a single price, I can increase producer surplus here. And it's not one-to-one -one if we don't have horizontal marginal cost, but we can think of producer surplus and profits are really kind of not one to one, but they are generally moving in the same direction, right? If producer surplus is higher, profits would tend to be higher as well. Yep. Any questions on that? Yeah. If I want to do them free, uh, same kind of idea, although we would model a little bit differently because what's probably true under that scenario, where are we at in time? Uh, so, Buy one, get one free would be something like, let's say the price was $4, right? And I valued, and here we'll do like a weird scenario. Let's say these are the first two and I valued these at, oh, what am I gonna do here? $3 and kind of 250. If the price were four, am I even gonna buy that first one? The price is above my marginal benefit of three. Am I gonna buy that? No. But if you offer me buy one, get one free, well, now I'm paying $4. What's my total marginal benefit of both of these? 550. So now I will buy those two units, right? It works a little bit differently because like, not buying the first one initially, and now I'm buying two, but it's the same kind of idea. I'm essentially lowering the price. Um, now, that one's a weird one because it really doesn't make sense for you to ever just buy one if it's buy one, get one free. Um, so it would go against our kind of basic models a little bit, um, but that that would be kind of how you think about it. Yep. All right. Okay, so. And how much time we have, 30 minutes left. So um, this is kind of just a summary, kind of a very basic model of the things we've kind of talked about. These perfectly competitive markets, total surplus would be the total area in between our supply, which here, if we have one firm marginal cost is supply. So all of total surplus here would be 
consumer surplus, right? The area between demand and our supply curve or the area above the price, below the demand. Those are the exact same thing under a perfectly competitive market if we had constant marginal cost. Now, as we move to a single price monopolist, we said, what's happening? Well, they're gonna set this price or quantity, sorry, wherever marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. They're then gonna go up to the demand curve to set the price. So when we now have producer surplus, consumer surplus is now only this area A, and we're no longer selling these units, so we have dead weight loss as well. So as we move from like a perfectly competitive market to a single price monopolist, what's happened? Consumer surplus went down, producer surplus went up, but also dead weight loss went up. Now, if instead of a single price monopolist, they're able to price discriminate, and here I put up a perfect price discrimination monopolist, but the same directional with changes would happen if they were able to only do some, like, like not perfect, but some price discrimination. Notice consumer surplus is going to decrease because now the price I'm charging them is exactly equal to their marginal benefit or the demand curve. So with a perfect price discrimination monopolist, consumer surplus decreases to zero. We said the price discrimination monopolist will choose this perfectly competitive quantity. So dead weight loss also goes to zero. It's just that now what's the difference between price and marginal cost or supply? It would be this entire area. So all of total surplus has now become producer surplus. Right? So what world do we want to live in? Well, dead weight loss is zero with a perfect price discrimination monopolist. A consumer surplus is also zero. This gets at that kind of now it's an ethical philosophical question. Okay? But we can kind of compare these three different types of markets. All right, any questions here before we keep moving? Okay. So I think um, kind of already went through some of this. Like, you know, age is a really popular one that we see used. So these senior citizen discounts, I put movies, no one goes to the movies anymore. But right, anywhere where you would go to like to a theater or watch a show, you'll often kind of see, they might not have senior citizen discounts. What might a lot of you be able to get? Student discounts, why? Because they know that you aren't on as high of an income as most people. And so you have a lower ability to pay, right? So we see these kind of discounts based off of age. We already kind of talked about the coupons, need-based financial aid. We also had this idea of quantity discounts, right? We know that people are willing to pay less and less. So if you kind of think about this in a weird way, if you went to, um, <clears throat> if you look at like, a, well, I'll, I'll use my diet Mountain Dew example. We get like a 32 ounce drink from somewhere. Maybe it's like a dollar fifty, and then like the 44 ounce. So you know, think about those first 32 ounces. You paid not quite, but about. 50 cents for the 10 ounces. Well, then to get another 10 ounces, go from 12, but I'm rounding here, 32 to 44, maybe they're like, oh, well, now we're only going to charge someone, you know, a dollar seven five, a dollar eight nine. Usually that increases it near as much. Why? Because they know after you have that first 32 ounces, you value the next 12 at a much lower amount, right? So we'll kind of see these quantity discounts pop up with products as well. Mm -hmm. um, so is it a good deal worth waiting for? Just price discrimination, right? So I'll mention another form of price discrimination. If it is based on what building one needs to pay, if you go to like uh, Kohl's or any store, right? What quite often there's a rack that is the clearance rack, right? So kind of what they've done there is essentially anyone who's willing to buy that good for a higher price has already bought it. Well, there's now no one left who values it higher. Well, there might be someone who kind of liked it, but the price was too high. So what do they do? They mark it down and now sell to those people who weren't willing to buy it before, but now at this lower price are. So kind of these ideas of sales and things like that, always be skeptical. Is it really a sale, right? Or is it really these clearance items that are just trying to get rid of? No, it's probably some form of price discrimination. Um, let's see. I want to make sure we have enough time to get through things here. So I'll hold off on the patent because I don't think that's as important for us. So I want to make sure, and I mentioned this a little bit at the end of last class, okay? and we use this term of natural monopoly. So I don't know if you remember how I kind of described a natural monopoly, but it's that given the costs and given what current demand is, there's only enough demand to support one firm. So if I think about a natural monopolist, where would the 
single price monopolist. So we're back to a single price monopolist. Where would they choose the optimal quantity? My image is a little off here, but it's where marginal cost is marginal revenue. They then go up the demand curve and set that price. In theory, where would the perfectly competitive price and quantity be? Where demand is equal to, so if we had a perfectly competitive market, demand is equal to supply. Or because we only have one firm, the supply is really just based on the marginal cost of one firm. So the perfectly competitive market, oh, sorry, I didn't say this. So we've got positive profits for the monopolist. If we had a perfect, perfectly competitive market where we had the quantity at supply is equal to demand, what's gonna be true here? Well, that price is below our marginal cost. So what's gonna be true? We would have losses. So if we try to regulate a natural monopoly and force them to charge the perfectly competitive price in this case, well, that price is below average total cost, profits are negative, what's that firm gonna do? Shut down, exit the market. Now, how many firms exist? We have a natural monopoly. So if one firm leaves, that market doesn't exist. This entire area would be dead weight loss. We lose the market completely. So what can I do? Where can I regulate this monopolist such that they'll still stay in the market, but I don't have all of this deadweight loss, right? Well, what if I lowered the price here? Well, price is still above average total cost, so we're still going to have positive profits. We've increased quantity, decreased deadweight loss, so that could work. So we would kind of continue to push that price down. But as soon as we get to prices that are below that average total cost, we now know profits are negative, that firm would just exit. Oops. So the point that we would kind of want to regulate this market would be that point where the average total cost intersects our demand curve. We would want to try to put a price or set the price to be exactly equal to that point. So um, what could we use to make sure the price is lower than what the monopolist is setting? We said last class I could use a price ceiling, right? So what might this look like if we had not constant marginal costs to kind of give you a look at it? Let me like toss this marker. So let's say I had my demand curve, marginal cost curve, twice the steep marginal revenue, okay? And I want my average total cost to look something like this. Yeah. Well, if I try to, so here's our monopoly quantity. Here's our monopoly price. If I try to set the price down here, I put a price ceiling here. Well, I can't charge a price any higher than that. What's true about the price relative to average total cost? So I've got negative profits, they would just leave. So where can I set the price that would the firm would be indifferent about leaving would be exactly where the price I'm setting is equal to my average total cost. So I would wanna be setting this price ceiling exactly equal to that price where my average total cost intersects my demand curve. Okay. And at that point, price is equal to average total cost. So when we're thinking about profits, if price is exactly equal to average total cost, my profits there would be zero. We said at the end of last class, that's the ideal world, but that means that the firm would be indifferent. So what might I want to do if I wanted to err on the side of cost? Mega price is just like slightly above head, right? Just to make sure. I know they're indifferent about being in this market or not. So maybe I'll set the price to be just slightly above that. Okay. Questions on that before we keep moving? Yeah. Lump sum subsidy. You're just talking about putting price ceiling here, but then giving the company enough money they choose to stay. You could do that. Although if you're already using a price ceiling, why wouldn't you just 
put the price ceiling in there. In fact, um, you bring up a good point. Why wouldn't I, and I could use a subsidy, but why wouldn't I, if, what's one way I can increase the quantity in a market? Use a subsidy, right? So if I gave a subsidy so that it shifted marginal revenue, I don't want to muddy up this graph for anyone who's still drawing it, but if I had marginal revenue and demand up here so that they choose kind of a higher quantity, well, I could still reduce what looks like the dead weight loss because I've pushed quantity up. The problem is I've reduced dead weight loss a little bit, but what have I now generated with a subsidy? A very large government expenditure. So then I would have to factor that in. Now that's part of my dead weight loss as well. So a subsidy wouldn't be as effective as using these price controls. Does that make sense? All right, these are good kind of next step questions. So I wouldn't ask you about substitute. I think I've got it in the slide that you could use them, but they're not gonna be as efficient as these price controls. Okay. Um, so we'll go back to the slides here. Now, I kind of mentioned, right, this idea of a kind of setting that price where average total cost is gonna hit the, um, the demand curve. That'll be if we have a natural monopoly. Okay, so if I'm setting the price exactly equal to marginal cost, that ended up being below average total, we said that would drive them out of the end. So we can't simply set the price equal to marginal cost or get to this perfectly competitive point, right? Now we could, if it isn't a natural monopoly, right? So we could use subsidies. Once again, that kind of creates a problem in and of itself. We could push that price to the marginal cost level or, and I'll show you why, if it's not a natural monopoly, that would work. We also could just kind of take over, right? Give government ownership. And then the government could just artificially lower the price to where they know, for example, 70 years ago, they were setting the price of stamps. They know if you wanted to send something, you had to buy a stamp. They weren't charging an outrageous amount of money. They weren't really acting like a monopolist. They were keeping the price of stamps at a point that would make profits of the post office exactly equal to zero. Right? Um, but just to be kind of complete, if we didn't have a natural monopoly, why could we see that setting the price be equal to marginal cost actually work? Well, what do we know is true about a perfectly competitive market in the long run? We know that the perfectly competitive quantity would be the minimum point on our average total cost curve where our demand, right, is equal to supply, which is kind of where we're going to set this perfectly competitive price. If the price is equal to average total cost, we said perfectly competitive profits will be equal to zero, right? Now, if I had a monopolist here, they're going to make pricing decisions based off a twice as steep marginal revenue curve. Their price they're going to set is higher. But now if I'm trying to regulate this market, which isn't a natural monopoly, maybe this is just some firm that has been able to kind of create barriers to entry to other firms. If I were trying to set the price here, how low could I set the price? all the way down to that perfectly competitive point. So if it isn't a natural monopoly, and then maybe there's some barriers to entry that are keeping other firms out, I could actually use a price ceiling, set it exactly equal to that perfectly competitive price. Now in this case, marginal cost pricing will work, right? Now I can set that price ceiling to be exactly equal to the marginal cost, profits will be equal to zero, so the firm isn't gonna to wanna to exit. But if I do have a natural monopoly, setting price or that price ceiling exactly equal to marginal cost where that perfectly competitive market would be at is actually going to drive that firm out of the industry. Okay. So it kind of depends on what the cost structure of the market looks like or the firm looks like relative to its demand. If there's not enough to demand given the cost structure to support any more than one firm, well, there we can't set price equal to marginal cost. It's going to have to be a little bit above that. Yeah. Excuse me, notice here this price ceiling would still be above 
the marginal cost of that last unit. Here, the price is exactly equal to the marginal cost of that last unit. So kind of a difference between a natural monopoly price regulation and not a natural, not, not a natural monopoly price regulation. Okay. Any questions on this before we keep moving here? Yeah. So they're still both single price monopolists. The difference between a regular, regular monopoly and a natural monopoly is that with a natural monopoly, the current demand and cost structure, there isn't enough to support us really getting to that perfectly competitive point, right? It has to be that there's only enough demand that will support one firm. Yep. Okay. All right, so where am I at here? Um, all right. You know, some stupid meme that I put in there about monopolies. Um, but what we can do, make sure we have time for it. And I think I've got one more thing we'll go through after class. So this is a little bit of like just kind of fluff slides. So if we don't get to these, I'm not uber concerned. So I want to make sure I, we definitely get through the top hat questions. All right. So we'll get these pulled up. Now, these should be kind of easy. I think uh, I'm going back to talking about some price discrimination stuff that we were talking about early, earlier, sorry. <clears throat> so these might seem kind of easy given the material that we've now covered. I also have one additional type of example that could be helpful on the quiz and subsequently the exam. So let's go so I don't confuse joining. I've got my questions in another old section that I wanted to use. So, nope, module two, whoops. All right, so this might be a little bit small, but I'll kind of try to point out what these values are for us. So if I'm thinking about here, if I had a perfectly price discriminating monopolist, right, I still drew in that twice as steep marginal revenue curve, but if they're price discriminating, what do they use that curve to do? If I'm a perfectly price discriminating monopolist, do I use that twice as marginal twice as steep marginal revenue curve? No. In fact, what is the what becomes the marginal revenue curve for a perfect price discriminating monopolist? The demand curve. The price I can charge was exactly equal to consumers' marginal benefits, which is represented by my demand curve. So what where does that marginal revenue equal marginal cost? That looks like it's a quantity of so these jumps are two. 2.5, so 22.5 would be kind of my profit maximizing quantity if I was a perfectly price discriminating monopolist in this market. So it's really just, if I can perfectly price discriminate, I just go to that perfectly competitive quantity. Now, any questions on that? It should be, shouldn't be too bad. Now, if I instead think about, and this one hopefully will also be easy. This is one you could memorize or you could kind of actually work through it. If I have a perfectly price discriminating monopolist, what will my consumer surplus be here? Zero, right? So the reason why is because consumer surplus is the difference between the marginal benefits and the marginal cost of the consumers. What's the marginal benefit? The demand curve. What's the marginal cost? The price. If I'm perfectly price discriminating, the price I'm setting for every consumer was their marginal benefit. So it would be exactly equal to the demand curve. We have no consumer surplus. Now, because they chose the profit maximizing, not profit maximizing, sorry, the perfectly competitive quantity when they were maximizing profits, what is dead weight loss with a perfect price discriminating monopoly? So if I'm at the perfectly competitive quantity, that's where we said total surplus is always going to be maximized or dead weight loss is zero, right? So that's not the question here, but just kind of adding what a question you could see in. So there we have consumer surplus, but also dead weight loss would be zero, okay? Any questions on that before we keep moving here? Yeah, so this should be what? Consumer surplus is zero. And then 
think I jumped the gun a little bit, but we said dead weight loss will also be zero, All right? So these are some kind of easier yeah. questions. Um, now, one thing, um, there's a question on the practice problems and I need to get it updated. I think it was number four, where I asked you to calculate profits for a perfectly priced screen in Minneapolis. I won't expect you to do that on the quiz or the exam. So if you want to, you can ignore the second half question four. I'll kind of repost them, rephrasing the question. So you'll have some practice problems to work with. I'm really just more concerned with can you identify what's true about profits? Are they positive or if they're zero? All right. So we know in the perfectly competitive market, the profits will be zero. For single and perfectly priced screen in Minneapolis, they'll be positive. So another thing that I could ask you to do would be something like this. And this might get a little bit trickier. So let's say I give you, um, I don't know, let's do 100 plus, no, 100 minus kind of 5Q here, right? I then kind of tell you that marginal costs are constant at 20. Okay. If I just gave you these formulas, we've done a lot of things from this module with visions like graphs, but behind every graph, there are equations, right? So what am I really trying to figure out? If I want, if I asked you here for what the single price monopolists profit maximizing quantity was, I don't need just my demand curve. What do I need to make that decision? I need to know where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. Well, for a single price monopolist, what is marginal revenue going to be? We said it's going to start out at the same point as demand, but it's going to be, I'm always drawing it, steeper. How much steeper? twice as steep, right? So instead of negative five, my marginal revenue equation would be negative 10 Q here, right? So if I then want to solve for, where is that quantity that would maximize profit for a monopolist? What do I do? I set my marginal cost equal to my marginal revenue. And now it's just a little bit of algebra, right? So I move the 10 Q over, subtract, 20 from both sides, divide both sides by 10, and I get that my quantity would be eight here, right? So the fact that you know, if I give you a demand equation, you know marginal revenue will be that same equation, starting out with the same intercept, but twice as steep, okay? Any questions on that? Once again, I can almost guarantee you, you will have a question like this on the quiz. I say almost, I can't. So that's the first part, right? Now, what if I asked you for what's the price? How can I figure out what that monopoly price is going to be? Well, it's the point I'm at on my demand curve at this quantity. So all I would do is plug, plug that quantity of eight back into my demand curve. That would give me what? A price of 60, if I'm doing math in my head correct here. So I've got my monopoly price and my monopoly quantity now. Now, if I was able to perfectly price discriminate, what's the quantity that I would get to? Just that point where marginal cost is equal to demand. So how could I find that point using my equations? Well, I've got my demand equation. I know I've got constant marginal cost. All I'm doing there is setting that marginal cost equal to demand. So what, 20 is equal to 100 minus 5Q. Do a little bit of math. Once again, I get what? 5Q is equal to 80. Divide both sides by five. I get a quantity of what? 16, if I'm doing math in my head correct here. Okay. Now this one is kind of easy. What's the perfectly competitive price? At the last quantity in the market, the equilibrium quantity, if it's a perfectly competitive market, price should be equal to our everything, right? Price is equal to marginal revenue, is equal to my marginal 
cost. So if I have a constant marginal cost, what's my marginal cost value going to be at that quantity? 20, right? Whatever that marginal cost is. Okay. So I might give you equations, right? It's the same thing. We're looking for the same points. In fact, if I had the equations, I might try to draw this out in a graph just to kind of think about what I'm doing. I'm first finding where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. So I'm setting these equations equal to each other. How did I find the marginal revenue equation? It was demand, but twice as steep, right? Once I have that quantity, I go up to the demand curve to find the price. So I'll take my quantity, plug it into my demand curve to find what that corresponding price would be. Okay. So once again, I guarantee you'll see a question like this on the quiz. Okay. Any questions on this before we keep going? Okay. All right. So um, before we get out of here, right after class, you'll kind of see these following things. Right? Today's collections will pop up. I still am going to have them set to do as though we would have class on Tuesday. So just to kind of keep due dates the same, get on, get them done before 2.50 next Tuesday. You'll have a quiz. You'll have the module ready to do at the end of the day on Monday. Look for those replacement videos and Canvas announcements that accompany them. I won't see you guys for another two weeks until after Thanksgiving break. That's why I wore my tie here today. Um, so have a fun, kind of safe Thanksgiving break. Feel free to email or reach out even over the next week. I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Otherwise, I will see you guys in two weeks. Huh? Congrats on the kids. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Thanksgiving. You too. Last slide. Um, how to sign up? Great class.